what a magnificent creature he is. But guys, this little fella is in desperate need of our help. So in today's video, it's gonna be a bit of a tribute to the koala that is native here in Australia. Not only is the painting gonna be inspired by this beautiful creature, but we're also gonna be talking about the bushfires because a lot of people have been asking questions as to what actually is happening. Coming up. Hi again there guys, I'm here from Paint and Pino giving you some top tips for all things art and design. And in this video it's going to be very much a tutorial in terms of how to do a technique of painting. So I really want to think about how you can create paintings that have context and meaning. And obviously that's significant because we're going to be looking at how this creature is seriously endangered right now. So the painting's going to reflect that concern. I'm also going to be telling you an awful lot about what is happening over east in terms of the impact that it is having on our native creatures. So to start with I'm just going to go through the actual technique. So it's not very often where I'll sketch uh, a painting but because it's crucial that we get the actual uh, the proportion, the content, just the layout of this to make it look accurate I think it's pretty appropriate that we use a pencil here just to sketch it out. Now you'll notice I'm using a black canvas. This is a pre-primed black canvas that I've just purchased like this. So actually it's really handy when it comes to drawing onto because the lead pencil shows up really quite nicely. So with any form of composition guys, it's really just about making sure that you've got the placement of your main character. So again, I wanna make sure that it doesn't sit too high on the canvas, but also when it comes to doing the features, they happen last. A lot of people will start a drawing like this where they focus on the eyes because our eyes get drawn to creatures' eyes anyway. And then what will happen there is you actually start to find that you've misplaced or sort of misjudged where the actual uh, creature wants to go. So here I've done the main outline first, and then I'm going to add the detail later, just to make sure that we're getting this as accurate as possible. The other area that you do as well, it's just a real, uh, it's natural when we come to painting or drawing anything, that we actually make them look human. So what we don't want to do is make our little fella look like he's got human eyes. So we'll do a lot of focus in a moment when we come to the painting to really make sure those eyes are accurate. So paints are fairly basic today, guys. We're just going with the black acrylic. Obviously, I'm going to go with the white as well because that's going to be our main color scheme. It's just going to be a monochromatic painting. Monochromatic just being one color. But there's just going to be a hint of blue and a hint of pink through there as well just to really add up the drama to the piece. Brushes-wise, I've just gone with the 6mm round head so it can give almost like a sketch at this stage. I will go with a larger brush in a moment just to, like, to do the background area, but really we're now just sketching over that line that I've already drawn with the pencil. It is actually a gray color that I've gone with here. I don't want it to be too white, so it'll be too harsh. I'm just gonna darken that down with the black. Uh, you could actually even do this outline in the blue, but what you don't wanna have is that it stands out too obviously in a moment. Now I said earlier on about context. I am a massive fan when it comes to painting that your paintings have meanings. Everything I do has a purpose, it has a meaning. There are, there are two different types of approaches to doing art. One is for an aesthetic purpose. Aesthetic just being the look, the overall appearance, if you want to do a nice pretty painting, which is fine. A lot of people want beautiful paintings on their walls. Personally, I really like those paintings that have meaning behind them and that will often inspire the technique that I go with. You know, it'd be very easy to just sit here with you now and do a very realistic, naturalistic, almost photographic painting of a koala, but that won't get the message across that I want to get through to you guys in terms of the meaning behind this painting. So you'll see the lines and the mark making that I'm making here. It's quite manic. It's quite scattered. It's got a very disorganized feel to it. And that is with purpose. That is obviously to reflect what is happening in terms of the, the, the horrendous decimation as effects of, of a species that is occurring at the moment because of these huge fires. I will talk about the fires in depth in a moment, but I'm just going to explain to you this technique that I'm doing with the painting. So it has been sped up. This is 130% speed, just because I didn't want the video to be too long for you guys. Um, but it is important that you also get a sense of real time so you can see the techniques that I've been doing. 
So I'm talking about this manic technique. Again, with paintings, it's all about layers as well. So even though I'm doing this manic sort of sketchy feel, at the moment it looks quite messy, it looks quite scruffy. Trust me, in terms of the overall appearance, that is not what I'm going for. This is just the preliminary stage. And again, paintings are all about background to foreground. So we're just giving like a base color at this stage. And I'm really focusing on where I want the highlighted areas to be and where I want those low lights to be as well. So, uh, you know, we mentioned earlier about having the blue. I'm just putting some of that blue into the background just to emphasize where I want some of that extra color. Because if it was just gray, I think it would be a little bit too monotonous. I want there to be a little hint of of color let's even that color could have a meaning that color could mean just a hint of life a hint of hope that uh, these little fellas can obviously survive what is happening at the moment so again just sketching out this uh, really where i want the darker and the lighter areas to be this is going to be very much the lighter area on the back and you can see i'm using the larger 10 mil round round head brush this time just because it's easy to distribute the paint in a quicker fashion and then I'll go back to the smaller brush in a moment just to add some of that line detail. This style of painting I find is really therapeutic, guys, because it's, I, I talk about layers a lot. Um, you know, you really can keep working and working over these and it, and it just gets more satisfying the more you work into it. It's, it's like the ultimate therapy for me when I'm painting because I can really start to see those layers building to create something that's, that, that, that's what I'm looking for. I'm looking for organized chaos. Um, you know, I, I want my lines to be scatty, but they have to have meaning. They, there's a massive difference between somebody just sketching out something roughly, where there hasn't really been a lot of thought to where those marks go, as opposed to what I'm trying to do with you guys here today, which is have that effect of a manic, chaotic, mark-making uh, sort of technique of paint, but it really will have a, an element of accuracy about it as well. And that's much harder to do than actually just painting really naturalistically and very neatly, where I could easily just blend this paint in very subtly, but that's not the look I'm looking for. So again, just still working some of these highlighted areas. The beauty with working on black, of course, is that the low lights are just going to be left blank because I can't take the canvas any blacker than it already is. I will be using some black later just to darken down um, areas that I've done or I've overdone with the light. For example, the back here at the moment is it's a little bit too light, but I'm not concerned at this stage because it is just the background layer. So again, you can get that sense of technique with the, the the fluff and the hair on the ears. You know, the beauty with using a brush like this is it's almost like using um, a fan brush where you get those individual brush strokes. It's a little sort of strokes of hair. So we are looking for accuracy whilst making this chaotic mark making on the page. Now you'll notice I've left the eye. That is significant because that's got to be the most accurate part in the painting. So you'll notice when I come to do the eye in a moment, there will be no scatty lines with the eye because it's always in the eyes, whether it's a human painting or an animal painting like this, it's the eyes that make these creatures come alive. So you've got to be super accurate when it really comes to trying to get the, the light and the shade and the, and the mark making as well um, of the actual eye itself. So these fires, guys, um, I know it's been on the news. Uh, I've just been recently back to the UK for Christmas and was astounded, to be fair, that it was headline news every single day. We've obviously had it on our news over here because the fire started back over in September. September, for anyone that doesn't know, in Australia is actually our spring. Normally, a fire season wouldn't start till around now, you know, the end of January, beginning of February, sort of the, the peak of our summer is then. And if you're going to get major fires, that's when they tend to start up. Um, so the fact that these things started in September was, was a huge concern because ordinarily spring is when we get our rain. And of course, the fact that this, the fires had started up back in September, we'd had a series of uh, several weeks of 40 degree temperatures um, and it's just taken its toll. The, the ground has gone super dry. 
And of course, the nature of the bush in Australia is that you get a lot of, it's almost like debris. Anyone that's not, or that's new to the country that travels around our bush, they're surprised about how many twigs and how many bits of bark are on the floor. But that's the nature of the trees that we have over here. They shed their bark, they shed their branches very, very easily. So you do get a, a significant scattering of of kindling, as it were, which is ready to burn. So what we do have is very strict laws over here in terms of when you can actually have fire. So you'll notice a sign might say, you know, total fire ban, which means there's absolutely no naked flame anywhere if the temperature raises over a certain point. Now, of course, on top of the, the ground being so dry, our trees are full of fuel, you know, whether it's eucalyptus trees, uh, you know, the, 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 the different types of trees that we have are literally full of oil. I've been to the Northern Territory and been hiking through the, the bush and I literally saw a tree explode and it was the most terrifying thing I think I've ever seen. I didn't know that trees could do that. That was one tree, one tree that had been lit by accident and the whole thing exploded. So you can imagine that multiplied millions and millions and millions of times over. That's what you're dealing with in terms of the intensity. Just going to go back to the painting for a moment, guys, because I was talking about the eye earlier. So this is where I'm really starting now to focus on some of that detail. So I'm working with the highlighted white just to start with. And uh, we'll zoom in in a moment and I'll show you where we're going to get really accurate with that, with the shading. So yeah, back to the, the fires, guys, and why they're so significant and why they're so ferocious. Um, like I said, you, you're dealing with, you know, thousands, millions of hectares of, of oil and trees which you know naturally they're meant to burn they're, we live in a country where we've always had fire you go back to the aboriginal times aboriginals were the masters of, of working with the land and they actually used to burn off areas of land where they had moved from so for example if, if they were residing um so aboriginals if you don't know are quite territorial and they will move around so once they've lived off the land for however long and they've used up the resources the difference being, of course, Aboriginals knew how to live with the land. I think modern society lives on the land. There's a big difference there because we abuse it. Uh, we don't really respect it, whereas they knew how to look after the land. So they would burn it as a way of seeing that that's where they'd been and they'd moved on from it. So it was enabling them to keep a track of where they were to go. Um, and, and naturally, of course, these bushlands would burn, but they weren't built up with the fuel that we have today because purely of the amount of, uh, you know, the amount of people that live here, the amount of risk. Sadly, there is always going to be that issue with people setting fires on purpose. I will never, ever understand that. I don't understand how a human being can think that that is acceptable in any way but sadly that's just what happens in this day and age there are individuals out there who just seem to get a kick out of doing these things now you know most of our major fires start naturally for example if you go back to the black saturday fires which were then back in 2009 the worst fires that we had had in this country uh, where nearly 200 people lost their lives um, and that was purely because it was a 47 degree day in melbourne uh, the fire was started by, a, I think it was an electricity pylon that had, had, had collapsed in the wind, obviously had a spark, generated the fire. But then on top of that, what happens is you get individuals who set their own fires off. It's almost like they know that the fire brigade can't handle it, so they're going to do their own fires as well. And it's beyond devastating in terms of the impact that it can have. Just going back to the eye here, guys. So I'm really just focusing now on getting that accuracy. It's a combination of highlights and lowlights. So using the white and the black just to really give a bit of depth in terms of the outer area of the eye, just to sort of make it stand out. The actual shape is really important as well because, again, you don't want to make it too human. You don't want to give it like that creepy human feel where we're very used to drawing or painting human eyes. When it comes to animals, obviously, you've got to be really accurate in terms of the angle. So they've got quite a, a sloped uh, angle with koala eyes. And I'm just going to put some of that exaggerated highlight just above where you can see, just to give that emphasis of the slope going in towards the middle. 
so yeah back to the black saturday fires guys so that that was at the time australia's worst fire i mean at the moment we're still in the middle of what is an unprecedented event so only time will tell in terms of how horrendous the the impacts of these current fires are going to be but i think it's fairly obvious to the rest of the world that they they've already been horrendously destructive particularly to these guys to the koalas now you know unfortunately they are in they're one of the few creatures that they can't run away they're not fast movers they don't burrow they can't get underground their habitat is in the trees you know and a lot of fires which occur uh, tend to be on the ground but it, when they get really really severe they go up into what's called a crown fire where they go up into the trees at the top you can see just where i'm putting some of that highlight into the eye it's a very subtle gray and then just a bit of a, a flash just to, to really emphasize where the, the, the eye glisten is going. So yes, yeah, so sorry, back to these, the fires up in the crowns. So the crowns being the leaves of the trees. And that's when you get these ridiculous height flames going through. And these guys have not got a chance. Uh, you know, I just, I can't even imagine what it must be like for the koalas when they're just stuck, trapped in their own home. And there's nowhere for them to go. The statistics are terrifying. They are absolutely horrendous. Apparently, they believe that over 30% of the koala population have been wiped out. There was another statistic I saw in the news the other day, which was there's up to now 1 million animals being killed, they believe. I mean, I know it's very difficult to have these guesstimations because there's no possible way you can get through. But they're just basing this on the amount of forest that's burned already. So for you guys watching in the USA, for example, they believe that it's an area that's larger than the whole state of Michigan has already gone up in, in smoke. And Europe-based, that's the same size as Portugal. And it's just very, very, very difficult to comprehend the scale of this fire. Um, and, you know, the fact that it goes pretty much from the whole side of the east coast of Australia, from the north down to the south. We're lucky here at the moment in the West. We haven't yet been affected. I say yet because you don't know what's around the corner. But touch wood, we don't get a major fire here this year. We get fires every year. That We live with that. We're used to that. But it's the scale of these fires over East that it's really, really unprecedented and is having such a huge impact on our animals. So why are the fires so bad? I mean, again, I talked about the fuel in the trees and how it just continues to generate the energy for the fire. We have huge amounts of wind as well. One thing that I wasn't aware of that I've only recently discovered um, was when these fires get so big, it's almost like a volcano. So if you imagine the funnel cloud going up, they create their own weather systems, which they can actually generate thunderstorms which of course is catch-22 because you're going to then get fire from those lightning strikes. So it just adds to the whole situation. But when you get these huge chimneys of, of smoke going up into the air, they can literally collapse. And when that smoke uh, chimney collapses, you it's like a pyroclastic cloud from a volcano. And that's when you get these horrendous winds and then the fire can move up to 80 miles an hour. And that's when a lot of people get killed. We, there was a recent firefighter whose truck was blown over by the wind. And that was from that situation. You know, it's literally a storm within a storm. Um, so it's just horrendous what, you know, the scale that these things are, are creating. And, and it's impossible to get on top of them unless nature changes its course. You know, you are relying on wet, wet, wet weather you're relying on the rain which as of today they've finally had the first batch of proper rain so fingers crossed obviously things will start to calm down but you're on tender hooks because the whole land has been burned so horrendously it only takes one extra strike to start up again but uh you know that that's what it's talking about that that's what it's going to come to in terms of getting these fires to actually start to you know to be able to control where they're going just back to the painting here, guys. You can see I'm just mixing in some pink. I've, I've had some of those blue streaks working through. The pink's really just, again, to just give a little bit more of a, a contrast and a dynamic element to the painting. You can see I'm really emphasising those chaotic lines now. Um, and as I said to you earlier, you know, I do like these paintings to have meaning, to have context, to have purpose. So again, these scatty lines is to show the chaotic distress disruption that these poor creatures are currently going through but also the color is just that 
slight symbol of hope that uh, you know there are some amazing people out there doing some wonderful things for the koalas there are loads of videos online and which i've seen i'm sure you guys have too where you can see people who are doing some wonderful things to help um the last thing i saw which melted my heart was when i saw that they've been dropping thousands and thousands of tons of vegetables um so that the the animals that have survived the fires actually got have got something to eat because all the vegetation is being wiped out um so yeah so that the color was just symbolizing that sense of hope to really try and you know the, for every horrendous situation that happens there's always some good people out there as well so now it's more a case of just finishing off with the detail i really want to just emphasize those highlights i think what's happened with the the use of lines and the use of mark making is that i've lost some of those highlighted areas in the ear i really just want to sort of try and generate more of a sense of, of detail with the koala So if you have got any questions, guys, please do um, comment below. I always endeavour to try and reply to every single person that gives a comment. Um, once again, if you are looking to help out, and I know people have been donating in their thousands, I didn't want this to be like a, a plea for money because people give to their own charities anyway. But I have had a lot of people asking on Instagram which charities would be best to give money to because I'm always worried that if you give to a charity, there's a lot of scammers out there. For me, the Salvation Army, guys, you cannot go wrong. Um, you know, they're doing an amazing thing in terms of distributing the money across the board. So I'll leave a link below and uh, please do feel free if you want to give a donation. Thanks for watching today, guys. I hope you enjoyed the painting and uh, we will see you next time.